Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. My name is Catherine. Um, I'm one of the volunteers with the Arc Society, and I'm honored to be emceeing tonight. Um, I just want to thank everyone for coming out and for supporting Arc and our upcoming projects. Well, um, we have recently selected three wonderful children um, who are in need of some pretty significant renovations to access their homes, um, as well as get up and down stairs, be more independent in the bathrooms, and just really help their families out with some of those mobility concerns. So we'll be introducing their families and those projects in the upcoming weeks. So keep your eyes out on social media and on your email. We haven't announced anything yet, but you'll be the first to know if you're signed up to our newsletter or if you're following us on Instagram or Facebook. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. So please do feel free to ask any questions in the chat box throughout and we'll do our best to monitor it and bring attention, bring questions to the attention of the speakers at an appropriate time. And we will also have time at the end for any questions. For all of you social media fans, please tag us at Arc Calgary, and we will have a brief a two to three minute ish intermission halfway through. So thank you for those of you just joining us. Tonight's ARC Speaker Series focus is Calgary's push for accessible recreation, which is perfect timing for those of us that are really aching to get outdoors with the restrictions changing, summer being in full swing, and people just wanting to be out and about in our beautiful city. So we have two fantastic speakers joining us today. We have Joan of the City of Calgary Parks Department, as well as Karen with Calgary Adaptive Hub. So to talk to us about what the City of Calgary Parks Department is currently working on in terms of new and exciting inclusive parks and accessible facilities, we have Project Manager Joan McDonald. So Joan will tell us all about how we can provide our input into accessible parks and recreation spaces and how we can contribute to the creation and design of these spaces in our city. So without further ado, I would like to pass it over to Joan. Hi everybody, hope everybody's doing well tonight. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. And can you see that? There. Um, so I've been working for City Calgary since 1996. And I think this is one of the most exciting and rewarding projects that I've ever had the opportunity to work on. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about these playgrounds and I'll start with what inclusive playgrounds are. So we're familiar with barrier free. So these playgrounds are accessible um, for kids and caregivers alike. Uh, but beyond that, they're designed with diverse needs and abilities in mind. So they consider as many users as possible. Um, they're in spaces that enable child development through play. So we know that child development or play is important aspect of child development. And um, these designs maximize the physical, social, emotional, sensory, cognitive, and communication benefits of play for all kids. So why build these playgrounds? Um, and why build 10 this year? I am pretty sure they're not trying to kill me. And it has more to do with um, the city of Calgary's corporate accessibility policy. So this policy guides our developments um, and it aims to enable participation and um, access of people of all abilities for Calgary. Um, and parks in specific has a goal to create recreation and play opportunities for everyone. And um, back in 2018, uh, as, a, as a director from a Notice of Motion of Council, we developed our um, play spaces, our inclusive play spaces implementation plan. Matthew Blair's the um, infrastructure lead, and he developed this plan with the help of the Advisory Committee on Accessibility. Um, and the goals and our uh, current state were identified in that. And our, our aim was to 
build out over the 2019 to 2022 budget cycle. But these playgrounds are actually quite large. They are um, 600 square meters um, in size, usually minimum. Um, they have a unitary pour in place rubber surfacing, um, which is um, our choice for accessible uh, fall surface. And they are generally have larger equipment. And um, because of that, they can be quite expensive. You can look at upwards of $500,000 for these types of playgrounds. So we were excited to um, be building initially three of these playgrounds in 2021 uh, with the help of partnerships um, through Parks Foundation and community associations and charitable organizations um, to, you know, uh, bridge those funding gaps. Uh, we thought we would be building three. Then the province announced the municipal stimulus uh, program funding and that opportunity, we asked council if we could um, apply for some of these playgrounds that we had planned out in our 2018 uh, plan. And we were happy that we had that plan in place because the province told us that uh, these playgrounds needed to be built in 2021. That was our um, timeline. Um, so getting back to that plan back in 2018, we found that uh, in Calgary at that time, we had 1,100 playgrounds. 30 of those had at least one piece of accessible equipment. Um, of those 30, 14 had accessible pour in place surfacing to them. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, an additional 56 had accessible surfacing only. Um, so what we were looking at was inaccessible fall surfaces inaccessible routes to the playground, a lack of enabling infrastructure, so things like parking, and the designs were poor. There was no focus on inclusion. It was more of um, just about accessibility, so say a ramp. Um, and in some cases, the uh, accessible parts of the playground were uh, separate from the regular playground. So that's not inclusion, that's separating people um, from each other. Um, oops, there, so we said to ourselves, what would Leslie do, right? And we developed some goals for parks to aspire to. And what we'd like is um, for everybody in Calgary to be able to drive to um, an inclusive, playground or an inclusive recreation opportunity within, you know, five kilometer catchment area of where you live. To begin with, our focus is going to be on the regional high use parks um, because they have some of the enabling uh, uh, amenities that help out with this. Um, our focus is going to be on inclusive design, not just accessibility. So the universal design concepts. Um, and we want to then, after that, incorporate inclusive elements into smaller locations because you can't always afford or have the space for Disneyland in every park, but um, you can have a, that on a smaller scale. Um, so what we looked at with our kind of inventory of parks of where we might be able to build these playgrounds was whether or not we had an existing playground on site because that makes it easier for development. Um, if the site was big enough to incorporate that larger footprint that's necessary. Um, we preferred to have a parking lot. And if we didn't have that, we were looking for accessible street parking, proximity to major transit routes, and um, a washroom, because that makes you, um, you know, enables people to stay longer at a park, no matter who you are, if you've got a washroom close by. And whether or not the route to the site was accessible. And by that, I mean, um, you need a flat site uh, for your pathway to the playground to be um, ADA compliant. It needs to be under a 5% grade. Um, so you can build it on a hillside, but it'll cost you a lot more. So we were looking for um, flat. 
this is a distribution map of where we plan the playgrounds. So you can see it's um, fairly well distributed across the city in these uh, 10 sites. Um, there's some gaps there that we're eyeballing, but um, for now, we're pretty excited to have these 10 go in. Um, some common elements you'll find with these ones are that they're there will be accessible equipment, so equipment that you can transfer from your mobility device onto, um, and there'll also be some fully accessible equipment. So that by that, I mean, you don't have to leave your mobility device. So we've looked for um, in the industry, what's available right now, um, shade incorporated into the equipment, um, some shaded seating, uh, barrier free access to the site. Uh, so I'm building pathways that go right to the playgrounds. Um, accessible fall surfaces, of course. Uh, enclosure spaces for quiet retreat will be incorporated in all the designs. Sensory play items and accessible parking spaces. I was able to get street parking with curb cuts in all the locations where there wasn't a, a parking lot. And seven out of the 10 sites have washrooms. So that was um, uh, a good feature for us to find. And I'll just show you some pictures of equipment that you might see there. But these are the common features. Each of these playgrounds will have unique features as well. So um, you'll find different um, uh, accessible types of um, equipment in each playground that'll be unique to that design and to that vendor. So this on the left is um, an accessible rocker. Um, manufacturers all seem to um, offer something of this nature. This one I think is at Rotary Challenger. And you can roll right onto it with your uh, mobility device and be on there with your friends. Uh, the swing on the right is a tandem swing the seat is accessible and you can have a parent and a child or another child, two children together on this type of swing. You might see a roller slide. Uh, this one's at Shoal Dice. Um, the space to the left there of this roller slide is so that the user can um, slide over and take their time getting back onto their using their mobility device and they don't have to rush to get out of the way of anybody. So that's kind of one of the enabling features that you'll see in the playgrounds. And on the right, that is a ramp. All of the multiplay units will be uh, fully ramped um, to access all of the equipment and uh, sensory items on the multiplay units. Sorry. So I'll just show you the actual um, design photos of the playgrounds. This one is the first one. It's up in Hidden Valley in the Northwest. It's actually complete. I think we're opening it tomorrow. This is the first one that we'll um, have available to people. This playground does have a parking lot and a pathway to it. It doesn't have a washroom on site, um, but there is shade, uh, picnic tables. Um, you can see a four-seater teeter there. That's an accessible item. The multi uh, ramp or multi play unit is fully ramped. This way, uh, rocker and um, swing. There's a saucer swing there, which is um, accessible. Lots of um, uh, sensory items as well. There's some photos. Somebody walked on my fall surface before I could take a picture, but we're going to wash that off. Um, and you'll see here in this one, we're trying something new along with the pour in place rubber. This um, grass a surface that you'll see is ADA compliant, but it's kind of what you would have thought of as um, AstroTurf. Uh, so we're trying that out with the rubber in some of the locations. So we're interested to see how that works out. This is South Glenmore Park, um, better known as Variety Park. So the Variety Club's been developing this playground. Oh, they developed it 20 years ago, but they've been slowly renovating it um, in phases. And this is kind of the last phase of the playground. Um, 
This multi-play set um, has, is fully ramped. It features um, the sway unit that looks like a uh, boat. So it's kind of got a nautical theme. theme. It's right next to a spray park. If somebody's familiar with this park, it is fully fenced all the way around the outside with a parking lot, a washroom. And I did notice a pretty interesting um, ice cream truck in the parking lot the other day. So it also, I should mention, it has a gazebo for birthday parties that's covered, that's fully accessible. This one is North Glenmore. It will feature a tandem accessible um, zip line, which people seem to really like. A lot of really uh, top of the line kind of musical instruments because there's no neighbors to disturb in North Glenmore. Fully ramped multi, um, a big um, astro spinner there in the background. And um, this park has a washroom next to it, parking. And it also has what I thought was really nice was an accessible um, picnic site, a group picnic site that you can book um, that's fully accessible with barbecue, all of that kind of thing. And there's a water fountain nearby for this one. This one is Sandy Beach. Um, this park is a regional, so it has a washroom, parking lot. Um, they are supposed to be expanding the parking here. If anybody's been to this park, parking is at a premium, but we will be adding some accessible parking spaces closer to this playground. Um, it's going to have one of those tandem use swings, fully ramped multi, as I said, and lots of neat sensory items and multi or musical instruments. Um, Edworthy Park, uh, similar situation, parking, uh, washroom. Um, this one has a theme, so it kind of has a farm theme because originally Edworthy Park was a uh, market garden and a uh, stone quarry, so we tried to incorporate sort of a little bit of the history of Edworthy Park into the theme of the uh, playground. So this one has one of the sway fun, um, or sorry, sway rocking units that it looks like a covered wagon and a little bit of a country theme to it. Um, parking lot might uh, be paved in the near future, but right now it's gravel. Uh, Somerset Square. So this one's in the deep south. It has a spray park next to it. Unfortunately, that's under renovation. Um, at the moment, but it should be completed by next year, I think. And it has a washroom on site, although that might be being renovated this year as well. It doesn't have a parking lot, but it, um, I did manage to get one um, accessible parking space near curb cut, quite close to the playground. Some shaded seating, some interesting climbers. Um, no musical instruments here, though, because it's close to houses. Uh, and you'll see, you know, the there is a merry-go-round featured here. That looks like an accessible merry-go-round, but what we changed it out to was a, um, a fully ground-level accessible merry-go-round that you can use with your mobility device. So it should be a lots of fun to use. This one, Vivo. So here we get into our partnerships with a Parks Foundation um, and the Creating Coventry Group. This group's been looking for a site for an inclusive playground for some time, but they were running into a problem with space. Um, there isn't really a regional park in this area that would, uh, would facilitate that. So one of our clever um, parks community uh, specialists um, came up with the idea to maybe take out a soccer field behind Vivo. Um, checked that the other soccer fields were able to hold capacity of bookings and he approached Vivo and asked if they would be okay with the public using their washroom and their um, parking lot. And they were absolutely fine with that. And so we approached Parks Foundation to partner with um, the uh, Creating Coventry group. And that group volunteered to um, uh, work on this project with Parks Foundation. They've gotten themselves a very nice, um, community gathering space there 
with uh, picnic tables, shelter, fully accessible with a barbecue. So that can be used by the whole community. This site is fully fenced. Um, folks with uh, kids on the spectrum find that uh, very handy. Um, it's gonna have awesome swing sets, some shade on the uh, fully ramped multi-play set, uh, the sway, um, the uh, sway rocker there is also on site, and I think it has a ground level merry-go-round. Um, so that's pretty exciting, and you can see the trees here. The trees will be put in uh, in 2022. There will be a big project by Parks to plant more trees around these particular playgrounds to eventually create shade uh, for them. So we're excited that Urban Forestry is going to help us out with that. Next one is Terradale. This is near the Ted Harrison School. Again, the uh, parent group from the school was interested in putting a playground, an accessible playground in this uh, site. And um, we've, the Parks Foundation has partnered with that parent group to create this playground. Um, again, it's fully uh, fenced and you can see it's pretty cool uh, colors, fully wrapped multi, some awesome swings. You can't see it in this picture, but there's also going to be some picnic tables that are covered and the pathway goes right up to it. Doesn't have a parking, parking lot or a washroom, but um, there is one parking spot near the school with a uh, uh, curb cut, sorry, an accessible spot. So that's going to be a fun one. Um, Ramsey, this is one that was already planned for 2021. The community group in Ramsey has been working on this for some time with a charitable organization and they've partnered with Parks Foundation to build this one. I'm showing you one um, portion of this, just one picture of it, but it's actually a three tiered um, playground. And it's kind of near the stampede grounds on McDonald Avenue. There's no washroom on site, but I did notice a pretty interesting ice cream store. Uh, kitty corner that you might want to visit if you go to this park um, and it will have some fully accessible features as well. Elliston. So if you're familiar with this park, this is where they host the Global Fest Festival. Um, this one was also planned. Parks Foundation has been working with, I believe, the um, Aaron Woods Community Association helped them out with this one for grant applications and um, volunteering planning. Um, you can see it has a zip line, a uh, pretty cool um, swing set, some uh, challenging climbing opportunities, fully ramped multi, and this one will have um, also musical instruments because there's nobody to disturb at this one. This will be done in two phases. Um, the playground will be done before Global Fest. Uh, but we'll have to finish our landscaping features after Global Fest in September. This site does have a washroom, but it's a pit toilet. It's accessible. It's a washroom. Uh, there's parking, accessible parking, and a pathway that leads right to the playground. So um, in future, we're uh, aiming for more regional sites. Um, and because of the um, I guess funding uh, conditions, we had to put these out really quickly and we couldn't do our normal um, engagement process. So what we're hoping is that um, when you visit these playgrounds over the course of probably next summer, because they won't all be finished until the fall here, you will then visit the calgary.ca inclusive page and maybe tell us what your feedback is on them and what you would improve, what you liked, what you didn't like, and uh, what you would add. And you can kind of help us design the next one. Um, and if you're interested in maybe volunteering or um, being involved in one of these projects in your neighborhood, you can contact your parks community. Actually, they're called parks community specialists. They used to be called um, liaisons. But if you contact that person in your neighborhood, they will help you to um, put you in the right direction to develop your playground. And um, I hope I've left enough time for questions.
Fantastic. Thank you, Joan. Um, yes, there are a couple of questions and I'll just go through them. So one of them was from Sienna um, and it was with regards to do your designs follow the RHFAC strategies, if you're familiar with those? RF, no, I'm not familiar with R that. What does that stand for? RHFAC. I'm not sure either. Perhaps, Sienna, if you could put a message in the box or uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, exp and provide the details of the acronym. Oh, sorry. It is the oh, Rick, Rick, Hansen. Rick oh. Hansen Foundation Accessibility Certification. So yes. Did the, des did the designs yes, they, follow those? Yes, they do. Um, we've used that guide heavily. Uh, we um, also engaged a um, consultant who has his own consultancy, but he was... Um, involved in developing those guidelines with when he was part of the Rick Hansen Foundation. Um, so he has um, helped us with our procurement and he's helped um, evaluate the designs when they came in. Fantastic. I have a question, a little biased um, as an occupational therapist, which um, stakeholders does the City of Calgary involve in inclusive and accessible design and does it include occupational therapists? The um, Committee for Accessibility in Calgary has a number of um, city folks that are administration and they also have private citizens that um, are um, in various occupations and they might be a specialist in, maybe they're an occupational therapist, maybe they're a specialist in, um, you know, CNIB or they um, are an accessibility specialist in, or they're disabled in their, um, you know, in their personal lives and they help us to evaluate our designs and give us feedback um, what would make our design better and so they reviewed all of the sites prior to the designs and told us you know you need to um, do certain things to make that a better design so I'm not sure if any of them are occupational therapists but um, they very well could be they serve on this board for uh, three year periods a rotational basis. Fantastic. No, that sounds great. And then I have one more question in the chat box. This one's from Glennis. And it's given that the city has been able to accelerate construction of such a great variety of inclusive and accessible regional playgrounds, what are the next priorities? And are there more regional playgrounds to work on or are smaller community playgrounds getting to the top of the list? There are regional sites that we'd like to develop. Um, I don't want to say which ones because they are not, um, you know, uh, I can't really say yet, but there are some regionals that we'd like to hit. And then after that, yes, our priority is smaller sites and um, in regions that maybe are um, lacking in that facility. Fantastic. All right, so those were all of the questions that we had in the chat box. Does anybody have any other questions for Joan before we take a very brief one to two minute intermission? If there are, feel free to unmute yourself briefly. Otherwise, if you have any questions later, we can always see if we have time to come back to Joan at the end of the speaker series tonight. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Joan. So we will take a very brief one to two minute intermission just for whatever anyone might need to do for one to two minutes, grab a drink of water, have a quick snack, um, and we will be back shortly. All right, for those of you who have stepped away, that was about a minute and a half. Hopefully that was enough time for whatever little min mini break that was needed. 
Um, just a reminder, feel free to ask any questions in the chat box throughout. We will do our best to monitor the chat box and bring questions to the attention of the speakers. Um, and we'll have time at the end for questions as well. Again, don't forget to tag and tweet, et cetera, um, and tag at Arc Calgary about tonight's event. So hopefully everyone's rushed back over if you did leave your computers um, or phones, whatever devices you're on tonight. I would now like to introduce our second speaker for the evening. We have Karen. So Karen Dalman is the program manager at Calgary Adaptive Hub, CAH, um, which is an organization that focuses on creating inclusive opportunities for recreation and, for, and sport for children in Calgary. So she's going to talk to us about how her work is connecting families to accessible recreation, and she's going to highlight some of the opportunities that currently exist. So I would like to pass it over to Karen, welcome. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, so I'll first start off um, in the spirit of reconciliation to just acknowledge the land that we are all joining here from, assuming everyone's coming from the Calgary region. Uh, so I'm so grateful and pleased to be joining from the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika, the Kainai, Pakani, the Sutina, the Stony Dakota nations and the Métis Nation Region 3, and all the people who make their homes on this beautiful Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta. So as Catherine said, my name is Karen Domit, and I'm the Program Manager for the Calgary Adapted Hub, powered by Jumpstart. Um, I've been in this role since October, so um, often when we do these types of uh, engagements, we hear from families or folks watching after that, I haven't heard of you, so don't worry, uh, we're, we're brand new. Um, so since I started in this role since October, um, this photo is the closest thing I have to a professional headshot. And if you look closely, uh, you can see a small, tiny hand on my shoulder that I've cropped out. Uh, which feels really appropriate that I can't even uh, escape uh, these three, um, even in a professional setting, working from home, uh, coming into this role off of maternity leave for that littlest one. Um, so as you can see, uh, I am a mom of two uh, active young guys, so um, I, I certainly know the, uh, the challenges of finding um, activities to do over this past year and a half. So prior to joining uh, the Calgary Adapted Hub in this role, uh, I was the manager of athlete services for the 2019 Canada Winter Games in Red Deer. And, um, you know, it often seems kind of in this uh, adapted sport or disability servicing world that, uh, you know, we're a little curious as to what's everyone's backstory? How did they end up here? Um, so during the Canada Winter Games, um, there's 19 different sports jam-packed into 21 days, multiple cultural festivals and uh, different things happening. And this video that uh, I'm going to replay for you again here, um, this is the only thing I had saved on my phone from this world-class event uh, that got to take place in Red Deer. It's the only takeaway I have. Um, and I remember standing there on the sidelines thinking of, this was the most amazing gold medal game. So little plug team Alberta won the gold medal in wheelchair basketball um but on the sidelines I had this I had this really like mixed emotion of this is so amazing this is the best crowd atmosphere this is our best game day experience we've had for this entire games across all able-bodied sport or para sports this was the venue to be at this was the game to be at and what an amazing experience it is for these athletes to get to have this and the coaches, the, all the volunteers who put in all this time to get to experience this. But at the same time, I, I had a little bit of a bitter taste in my mouth of um, that this is likely one of the only times that these athletes will ever get to experience this um, in the Canada Games model. Um, this is the biggest stepping stone for most of Canada's top athletes to then transition on to the national team um, for international level competitions hopefully eventually one day Olympics or Paralympics. And, you know, that's not the case for everybody or every sport, but typically there's more international competition or national level competitions out there, which isn't the case necessarily for our para-sport athletes. And that's where, that's where I had this kind of like yucky feeling in my gut was that the opportunities are just not equal um, for 
the amount of options and varieties out there. And, you know, we need to do more um, in our sports system to remedy that. Um, and, you know, related to the work that ARC does too, um, through the planning process, there's just so many moments of uh, finding out, you know, advocating um, for the needs of athletes who have mobility restrictions or cognitive impairment, because this is a fully integrated event that has para-sport and special Olympic sport uh, built right in same time as able-bodied sport. Um, so just how many times I was faced with oh, well, we don't have enough roll-in showers to accommodate what you're asking for. Um, but, you know, we've hosted uh, the national Paralympic team here before for an international competition, and they've never had any issues. And, you know, that, no wonder we have such high dropout rates in sport. Um, you're talking about probably a 45-year-old who's figured out how to get through those challenges and just because they didn't say anything um just because they wanted to be on that stage didn't mean that it worked for them um we're talking about a 15 year old who might be traveling across the country for the first time um and if that's their experience do you think they're going to pursue that opportunity to to continue on in that sport and travel more if that's what they're greeted with probably not so i think um you know we all we know better so we need to do better and that's where i've really transitioned um into this uh, adapted sport realm because uh, certainly through that experience, I feel as though I know better and it's my opportunity to do some more advocating and, and try to fix the system. Um, so fast forward to today, uh, I am extremely grateful to be in this role as program manager with Calgary Adapted Hub powered by Jumpstart. Um, so what the heck are we? Uh, we're not an organization, we're just a collective. It's a partnership um, and these are the seven partners that have come together who have said, you know what, we were some of the biggest sport and recreation facilities in the city. We, we offer a lot of really great programs. We host a lot of really great events, um, but we don't, we're, we're not doing the best we possibly could in terms of disability inclusion, um, in terms of adapted sport and integrated sport, inclusive recreation. Um, and we think if we came together to share resources, um, and with a dedicated uh, person to, to oversee this and we implement some research and evaluation and learn from the community, uh, we can do a whole heck of a lot better and get our city to a more inclusive state. Uh, so you just heard from Joan, who's from the city of Calgary. So the city of Calgary and Sport Calgary kind of operate as our um, a ministry of supports and parent organizations. And then the other five partners, Winsport, Repsol, Vivo, University of Calgary and Mount Royal University, uh, actively deliver the programming. Um, I should say the City of Calgary Recreation also delivers a lot of programming uh, as well, uh, but it, it's not uh, behind the scenes, we, we treat it a little bit differently. Um, so, and of course, from our name, you can tell that we're powered by Canadian Tire Jumpstart, uh, which we're incredibly grateful for. So uh, there you can read our mission and vision, um, but simply put, we're here to build bridges. So we build bridges between our organizations, between families and opportunities, between programs and community, and between community and research, and between leaders and the information and resources that they have access to. So uh, you just heard me say that I started in this role in October. So uh, my hiring process was kind of through late summer uh, last year. And when we thought we kind of had that light at the end of the tunnel that, hey, maybe things are going back to normal. And then as you know, this winter things certainly did not go back to normal. And we're just kind of starting to feel it now what we thought we'd be feeling this time last year. So our plan A was our five partners had uh, programs all in place. Um, that was part of the proposal and it was uh, our job to um, to incorporate some research and evaluation through our partners at University of Calgary, really learn from the programs that exist and find ways to um, enhance and develop more partnerships in the city uh, to make these better, but really get in touch with the community, um, with those families who are using these programs and find out what are we missing, what needs to be done more, how do we make pathways in the city for more participation that are enhancing the incredible work that all the disability servicing agencies are doing or this adapted sport clubs that already exist. How do we how do we build off of those and make more options available um, that are complementary to what already exists? So that was plan A. Plan B. 
uh, there's been no programming up until now. Um, so what we did was we've taken, you can see there, that's a picture of the CAPA program at Mount Royal University, which stands for Children's Adapted Physical Activity Program. Uh, so they, the students there who run that program uh, took it upon themselves to, to go virtual. So they've uh, been hard at work doing pre-recorded programming, um, which will now translate into a summer camp they'll speak about soon. Um, our partners have all been going through uh, a lot of uh, disability inclusion training to make sure that you know all the right people in the organizations from top down, bottom up, um, all are on the same page that we're all committed to um, accessibility and inclusion. Uh, we've developed a, a community advisory committee made up of um, a wide variety of individuals of lived experience, some teens, some parents, some folks from the medical community, um, some accessibility consultants, and just a wide variety of folks uh, with lived experience to help guide us in these early days. Um, so, like I said, we had a whole list of programs that were ready, set to go kind of last winter, um, which we'll now see coming up in the fall. Um, so right now, what I can tell you that we have uh, open for offering. So in the top left there is the uh, adapted sport camp from the University of Calgary. So that is going to run as an in-person camp, um, which we're pretty excited about this summer. So that's in August. There's two weeks of that camp, um, one for teens, uh, grades 7 to 11, that will run August 16th to 20th. And you can hit up our website for all this information. Um, and then the week following is for grades four to seven, uh, August 23rd to 27th. Um, so this will be the third year, I believe, that camp has run. It didn't run, run last year. Um, so what's really neat is that we incorporate some research and evaluation um, optional for the campers to participate in it, where they get sent home with actographs to measure their physical activity levels. And we really measure like quality of life and surveying um, of different aspects of uh, how how they're feeling during participation after um, a few months after what the impact of the the camp has had on them so we can really learn to make it better for future uh, and then we share that information within the entire collective um, and then Mount Royal like I said they're doing um, a virtual camp so you know we're not totally sure you know are, are folks zoomed out or not yet but we wanted to make sure that there was still a virtual option available this summer too so that'll be running at the end of July it's for ages five to ten so there's pre-recorded sessions and live sessions built throughout that week so registration is open for both of those and programming is all free um, thanks to our support from Jumpstart um, and just two weeks ago, we launched an adapted play from home kit as well. So uh, we had 50 lucky families um, that <laughs> sold out, I, I say sold out, it was free, um, within, uh, I think, an hour and a half of us posting it live. So we were kind of blown away by that. Um, and so they were able to pick up their, their kits from uh, each of our partner locations. So the Shoal Dice Park that Joan just spoke about was one where we had families come pick up their kits from and get to see the, the incredible inclusive playground there, which, by the way, is a jumpstart playground, too, um, from our funders. Um, so boiling back to that, that's kind of the work our partners do. Um, but how do we connect and engage with the community? Um, so kind of as we were uh, figuring this all out, um, kind of in those early days, uh, we had a really unique situation that, that kind of just fell in our laps and was a, a, opened our eyes to where, where we needed to take this uh, with this collective initiative. Um, so this is a quote from a mom, Trina, who uh, her son's name's Brandon. They reached out to us, uh, I think it was about November or December last year so very early on um, and they had moved to the Calgary area a couple years ago so they could be closer to Brandon's uh, healthcare team at the Children's Alberta Hospital or Alberta Children's Hospital my apologies um, they had moved here from a small town in Saskatchewan where they didn't have the uh, correct medical support there so moved closer here and you know being displaced out of their small comfort uh, community in small town Saskatchewan they had no idea where to turn uh, to find program programs that would be suitable for Brandon. So Brandon has CP um, and, you know, he's quite a bit of mobility, but he does have some balance issues. And um, 
he doesn't want to get involved in para sport he feels that that would be limiting the ability that he does have um but he can't keep up with uh typically developing peer so he's in that gray zone so trina reached out to the canadian paralympic committee of all places found a an a random info account to email um who then knew that we were getting up and started and said maybe you could talk to these guys maybe they can help you um so getting to know Trina and Brandon, we just realized so quickly that there are so many families in the gray zone that just have no idea where to turn. Um, and, you know, you can do a Google search, you can go through the Jouet app, um, you know, Children's Link is amazing, but, uh, you know, who, who can you talk to when you feel like you're in the gray zone and you just, you know, your kid wants to play soccer, um, but you just want someone to listen to figure out how to meet the needs of your kids so that they can participate. So that's when we, um, you know, really changed how we wanted to develop our website and our marketing and how we wanted to show up in the community. So not only to service our partners and create a better pathway in the system, but to really hear the voices of the community and have that drive where program development goes in adapted sport and recreation in Calgary. We, um, so our website is now live. Um, we built in there a personalized service. So this is super, super quick and easy. I know parents probably are hearing this thinking, oh, more forms. You can just email me too if you don't want to do this form. Um, my email is on the website. But uh, what we've set up is just like a super small little questionnaire to just get to know a little bit about your family. And then the next step is that we just have a Zoom call. I just get to learn about you. What experiences have you had? Um, what is your child interested in? I want to get to know your child. So if they can join us, that's great. What are they like? Um, what have you heard about? Um, and I'll provide you with a ton of resources of what I think might be a fit of what I know is up and running and what exists inside our partnership and outside broadly beyond. Um, and then, then we'll talk about, you know, what is like, what's the dream goal? Um, you know, cause it may already exist. There might be a program that's going to be a fit and we can find that for you, but let's talk about, you know, the, that outside of the box, what are things that you written off that you didn't think were going to be possible? Let's chat about that. And let's bring that forward to our partners who are so motivated and willing and want to hear from you and want to work with you to develop those programs. So we think this is a really cool way to engage the families, engage the community with the captive audience of our partners who have the resources um, to move these things forward. And of course, that sounds maybe a little bit too good to be true. And uh, it, it's a longer process um, than just saying, hey, I want uh, wheelchair fencing to to be open by this fall. Um, it's a bad example because we will have wheelchair fencing open by the fall, but um, you know, say it's a program, it, it may take us some time to get there and develop, but you get to be a part of that co-creation. We want, um, you know, nothing, nothing for us without us is the mentality. So um, to kind of summarize all of that, we're, we're here to support both ends of the spectrum. So that's what my role is to, to connect the community with the programs and make sure we're facilitating that, that appropriate pathway. Um, so do you just want to share, uh, another family quote that I recently had shared with me? Um, I had a parent say, um, to me in one of my recent meetings was, you know, I didn't ask to have a child with a disability, but I do. I've had to learn everything about their condition and become an expert in my child, but that's my job. I'm the parent. That doesn't mean that I should be the only person qualified to teach my daughter how to swim or how to ride a bike or how to kick a ball or how to play whatever sport she wants to learn how to play. There are already experts in these sports and these activities. So why can't they take the time to learn just a little bit about my kids so she can have a chance to play? And I think, um, you know, I, I carry that, that message around with me every day in every meeting I have that that is truly what we're here to do is that play and access to physical activity and access to sport is a human right not a privilege and you know we we just haven't done enough as a society and that's what we're here to change um so that's a little heavy uh I'll take it back a little bit and uh share just one more thing about our partners and something that I'm really proud about um 
is the story of our logo. So how we came here together. So the circle represents the seven partners. And while no circle is complete on its own, there are no gaps in the whole. The hub is stronger together, overlapping yet open to each other. Our goal is to create a better pathway to participation in sport and recreation for children, youth, and families living with disabilities that are physical, intellectual, sensory, developmental, or otherwise. People are at the core and the partnership forged within are part of the connection. So I said I would leave you with that. I'm gonna leave you with one more quote. I'm full of quotes today. Um, so this is from a sports psychologist uh, in the UK who does a lot of work with um, major league soccer teams. Um, so she, she says, sports can be seen as the canary down the coal mine for the wider culture and society they are a part of. Changes in sport do not stay in sport. They reflect what is happening in the rest of society too. Uh, so to give this a Calgary spin, she goes on to say that the athletes and professionals are speaking up to say that the way that things used to be run is damaging. She gives the example of Bill Peters resigning from the Calgary Flames in 2019, prompted by accusations of racism and abuse in the dressing room. Um, so we're seeing, you know, these culture shifts and a lot of it is starting in sport. I mean, if we even think back to COVID restrictions, the day that everything shut down was um, the day that the NBA uh, shut down and then it was that trickle effect. So we can see how huge of an impact on society sport can influence. And I strongly believe that this is where our potential is, that the Calgary Adapted Hub with the support of Jumpstart can influence a massive inclusion shift in our city and beyond. So I will stop there and allow some time for any questions. Uh, have our social media popped up there. Um, so give us a follow our website. I can pop it in the chat here as well. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much, Karen, for sharing that with us. I didn't see any specific questions pop up, but if anyone has any, then feel free to unmute yourselves now and ask them directly to you, Karen, if you'd like. Oh, and thanks for posting the Calgary oh. Adapted Hub link into the um, chat I think I just sent that to the panelists there. Now everyone should have it. Sorry about okay, that. Okay, perfect. Thanks <laughs> for sharing that link with us. Fantastic. And I encourage everyone to check that out and the amazing work that's going on with the Adapted Hub. Are there any questions for Karen? Or any questions that, that weren't addressed for, uh, for Joan that might have come up? I'm hearing crickets. Give it one more second. <laughs> wow, that obviously means that both of you did such a fantastic job that we don't have any questions because you've addressed all of them already. So, but, oh, there is one question apparently in the Q&A section. One second. I'm not, I don't see it though. Can someone send it? Oh, I see. Speaking as an adult who uses a power wheelchair, my experience has been that supports given to children tend to dissolve away when those children become adults. Is there a plan to help these kids connect and transition to available adult programs as they age out? That's a wonderful question. So we very intentionally have not capped the age in which uh, our programs are defined on. Um, so traditionally, uh, 18 or 21 um, would be defined as youth. Um, so we still use the term children and youth program um, because we do we do need to make that clear distinction that you know that we're not serving um, aging adults um, that that's just not not within our scope at this time. Um, but um, yeah we're, we're being really intentional in that um, you know one of the families we just uh, met with a couple weeks ago their son uh, was 24. Um, so we, we use the term youth very loosely um, in terms of supports to help transition. I mean, we're, we're well connected with uh, Children's Link and Between Friends and Autism and Asperger Friendship Society and all those disability servicing agencies who do a lot of that disability specific servicing work and helping with the transition. So, um, you know, we're connected with the support and resources there. Um, sorry, I'm kind of answering your question in a roundabout way. We don't have a, a clear plan at this time uh, focused on adulthood transition, but we're very intentional about not capping age. Fantastic. And sorry, I did see that there are questions in the Q&A and in the chat now. Um, so one question is, what support does Adaptive Hub need from the Calgary community? What can we mm -hmm. do? Yeah, um, 
community input. Um, we we just need to hear from the community. Um, and I mean, I'll I'll drop my my email in the chat box here as well. Um, yep, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, if you were to you know give a wish list or say you know I've heard of this program over here or you know what needs to happen is this. Um, that's that's what we need. Um, yeah, we, we need the power of people's voices and the power of people's stories to carry this forward. Fantastic. Any more questions here for Karen? Otherwise, there was one in the Q&A that was answered, and I believe everyone has access to it, um, which was for Joan. And that was, do you foresee any playgrounds being complete by the end of the summer? And Joan responded that all the playgrounds have to be completed this year and Hidden Valley is already complete. So for those of you who are wanting to get out to any of those inclusive and accessible facilities, you know, tomorrow or this weekend, Hidden Valley is the one that's already complete. So feel free to check that one out. And I believe that's it. I don't see any other questions. So at this time, I'd like to thank you both for sharing um, about both of the, the amazing work that the City of Calgary and Adopted Hub is doing and for supporting ARC and joining us in our third, uh, third speaker series. Um, for everybody that's still with us, I'd love for you to join ARC on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. Definitely watch out for our newsletter. As I did mention that maybe a sneak peek or a little introduction to our fantastic new families that we're gonna be um, assisting later this year for our new projects. So thank you again, Joan and Karen, for sharing your wealth of knowledge and trying to make this the most inclusive and accessible, beautiful city. <laughs> I'm a little biased, I love Calgary. Um, and sharing all the opportunities that our fantastic community has to offer with everyone. So unless anyone has any other final questions, I just wanna say thank you for supporting ARC. Thank you everyone for joining us, great turnout. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contest that, contest contact us directly at ARC and we can always pass them along to Joan or Karen um, if we're not able to answer them ourselves. So thank you very much. All right, in that case, I think we'll say good night to everybody. Yeah, thanks for having us, this is wonderful. Yes, no problem, thank you for joining. All right, everybody, have a good night. We're gonna sign off now. Hopefully see you at the next ARC event. <laughs>